But that's, that, it, it is like, it's gonna be a downside. It's definitely less appealing to play control because you kind of can't do gentlemen's. Generally speaking, I think price checking is like a, a terrible mechanic. Like only knowing a couple of your, like half your prices isn't good enough for her. The new Pokemon TCG rule structure prevents some challenges for control. Tournaments that would be having from anywhere to 14 to 15 rounds will now be having as low as 11 rounds. This is combined with the fact that now in order to reach day two, before it was a 19 match point cutoff to reach the second day, and now every number is a multiple of three. Control has the reputation of being prone to ties, and now ties are essentially worthless if your goal is to advance to day two at a regional championships. So with these new potential difficulties for control, I had to seek someone else's opinion on how this would affect the deck moving forward. I had the privilege of, of sitting down and talking to Sandra Wojcik, the greatest Pokemon TCG control player of all time, and hearing his take on the new structure, as well as many other things that this new system could bring up, and some stuff that's completely unrelated. This is definitely not the typical All Out Blood Soul upload, but it was my favorite one that I've ever recorded. So sit down, relax, and enjoy. So with the new tournament structure, um, Control's in kind of a weird spot, and I kind of wanted to talk about it today, but I'm not the most qualified person, so I brought on the most qualified person, so... Today, I'm joined by the one and only Sander Wojcik. What's going on? It's going good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Let's uh, talk about our favorite subject. Heck yeah. Control X and the future. So yeah, with if if you're not familiar with it, the um, new structure basically for for regionals makes ties essentially worthless. So basically, a double game loss unless you're going to get three of them for some reason. Um, so does that impact your deck building at all? Like, are you intentionally st like steering away from like more slower strategies, trying to build your deck more aggressively, or do you just not care? <laughs> uh, I I don't think the speed, I guess, of the of my strategy would be impacted that much. I think as long as you can finish at least one game, but I think basically every deck should be able to. I think, if anything, maybe you should either add more consistency so you don't lose games to breaking, because that's going to be really punishing. Like, you have a good matchup and you win game one, and then there's there's 10 minutes left and you get, get donked because your deck is too, too clunky. I guess that's a bigger downside. To be honest, it always kind of was, but now it's even even worse. And maybe uh, I think one of the reasons why it could be not that big of a deal for control is having very uh, skewed matchups. So having matchups that are having like 80 20 matchups and 20 80 matchups could actually be beneficial instead of having a lot of close matchups that are prone to go to game three and tie. And you can definitely build your control deck in a way that you have super favored matchups and just sacrifice a couple matchups. And having and if you do that, you could actually have a deck that is pretty well positioned to either win 2-0 or lose 0-2. So with that, that kind of mindset, and that, and that kind of plays into the way control decks are built anyway, targeting specific matchups. So that, that even though uh, there, are some, there, there are some downsides to the new structure for control, there is also some ways you could maybe build your decks a bit different, maybe sacrificing a niche matchup in favor of more consistency and just trying to have very heavily skewed matchup uh, win rates. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of like the the whole idea of just like I mean, obviously playing like playing more consistency is just pretty obvious, but that does make a lot of sense that like you can't like yeah, yeah it, if, if bricks it, are it essentially is, is, ties, then you got to yeah, reduce those as much as possible. Yeah, although I, I would say in a way it's kind of like a you know a sort of faulty logic because you want to have your you want to build your deck to be consistent, yeah, mm -hmm. regardless of the tournament structure, right? So. It's not like now all of us like you like right now you would you play just a complete mess of a deck and now uh, now only now you're gonna add some consistency but I think it's uh, like I think having losing games is gonna be a bit more punishing so yeah definitely uh, one thing that's been kind of a controversial topic for like a lot of the like, on stream games is like price checking and obviously playing a control deck when you like need to know your like what cards you have in your deck probably more so than most other decks um did, did that like change your like what like i guess method or rationale for price checking are you doing it as thoroughly as it is just time spent not playing pokemon generally speaking i think price checking is like a, a terrible mechanic you should just look at your prizes and uh at the start like during setup and just not waste 
the, that, that amount of time. I think they should definitely change that. But that it isn't the case, right? Like as long as there are, as long as you can't actually look at your prices, you should actually be really good at price checking. I think. I mean, so for control is it, so this is really weird for control for two reasons because you play usually you play more specific decks and even like specific combinations of tech cards. Like it's not only just one tech card that you have to check, but maybe a three or four card combination if you're missing one. You also have to know about maybe some other three-card combination that you should maybe like. You, you should also know your plan B if a certain card is priced. So you should check like a pretty wide variety of cards. I also think price checking, like learning it, is kind of easy, but also super boring. Yeah. What exactly. you should really do once you have your deck list set for the tournament, you should just take ten minutes, shift for your deck, place down six prizes, and, and and check what those six prizes are, and do that like. 10 times in a row, maybe even more. It's it's literally just memory, yeah. like a memory game. You can get really good at it. And there's one other thing why for control, and this has this right now it isn't the case, but there have there are so, certain cards that are way 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 better if you actually check your exact six prizes. And that, 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 those cards like Peonia and Gladion. Yeah. Like when you play Peonia, especially when you in Mewtwo you played uh, two Peonias. You always have to check your exact six prices because if you have like because if you let's say you have a hand with a research a peonia and maybe one card you would rather not research away and you have to you and, and maybe uh, you have to choose between playing your research or your peonia and you only know four out of your six prices like there's no way you can actually make a a proper decision right. Yeah. Because if you don't know that, if you don't know if there's an extra ultra roll or an extra tracking shoe in your prices, you can't really rate like the value of the Peonia. And maybe, maybe your prices, if you if you only know four out of your six prices, and those last two prices that you don't know about are like very bad or slow cards, and you need something more, something quicker, or you need to know if you have like a, a quick ball or an extra Snorlax to bench. Uh, that that like massively impacts like how you actually play out your game in a pr very practical sense. Same goes for Gladion. You actually need to know if you have a decision to make between what supporter you're gonna play. Like only knowing a couple of your like half your prizes isn't good enough for making the proper decision with cards like Gladion and Pionia. So when those cards are in your in your deck, you, I mean you you can kind of get you can can try to do like a, a half price check. In general, doing like a, a, a price check that isn't like your exact fixed prices is probably easier also in terms of mental fatigue. Yeah. But there are some, but right. it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of an issue that cards like Peonia and Gladion, those cards 100% become worse. They are just worse cards if you, if you don't, uh, or if you aren't able to decipher your exact, like even like an extra random card that isn't important in the matchup, knowing that you would hit it off of your Peonia, uh, um, uh, like changes your evaluation of how you should or shouldn't play that card during the game. Yeah, that's definitely a really good point. I think a lot of people wouldn't initially think about. I know like I, when I played it at regionals, I have it definitely, I like not, I don't ever check all six of my prize, like I always check the most important yeah. stuff, like the stuff I know I need. Yeah, it, it makes more sense because it's also like, just for the speed of the game, but also it's like it's checking an extra ultra ball or like an yeah. extra or like the fourth or um, like during the game, where it could matter, but like it, it's usually, yeah, it's just checking like your art you need for certain lines. Yeah, it's just more important and better. It's also better for mental fatigue to not check like unnecessary prices. But on the other hand, it's it's very trainable. It's like not it's not it's not difficult. Like it's not in it's not there's no tech there's no tactical element, it's just uh, something you could train, yeah. like price checking. But I, I also think I so I've I mean I, I think I'm pretty good at it, but I also think it should 100% be removed from the game. Oh, yeah, and it's going to take us and, and and it takes too much time. And time is like a huge factor in Pokemon because there's so much shuffling compared to other TCGs. Like the amount of shuffling in a Pokemon TCG turn is actually ridiculous. <laughs> like I think at the region, like in a Pokemon match, you you are just shuffling your deck for like you and your opponent combined. It's like ten minutes of shuffling or something. That's crazy. Sometimes, but uh, yeah, in, in terms of 
<laughs> how this relates to like tying and like tie management. I, I, I think you shouldn't really price take less because of the ties because you, it could be so like losing an entire game because you price check, you didn't check a certain like uh, how many of your like DTEs are, are in your deck. Yeah. Can be way, way more detrimental than maybe tying because uh, you price check too long. Definitely agree that like practicing price checking is like a really good like thing to point out because I definitely feel like it's something that people do not do. They just it's very boring. They, it's not yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's not fun. It's it's not how people play the game, right? It's not like oh, I want to play Pokemon, and the the skill I want to improve is uh, my price checking. No, but I don't think anybody thinks like that. Yeah, and if a lot of your testing's on live as well, like price checking on there is so much yeah. easier because all your cards yeah. are stacked and stuff. So yeah, it's exactly. not really the same thing. Even one thing I also did on PTCGO, like you could when you're discard, you could sort your discards, right? Oh, yeah. When you looked at your opponent's discard, I always di I always always didn't because it's more similar to like how an organized discard pal is in real life. There's also in in real life there's like you are I guess like tracking more things because you actually have to like do the, apply the rules of the game yourself. Right when you deal damage, you have to do it yourself. When you're making actions, like you're 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 like busy with more things. Mm -hmm. So also like having having like a mental track of what's in your prizes is. Also, more uh, yeah, it's just another thing to add when you're also trying to make sure you are following the rules of the game. Your opponent is following the rules of the game, and on live, uh, the game makes sure that the the rules are actually handled properly. So, kind of on the same like line as price checking, it's like a kind of another time management thing. Um, I don't know what your like stance on it, like gentlemen's agreements was um, like before these um, like rules that made ties a lot more punishing. Has that like philosophy changed at all with these new um, updates? Or are you still? Uh, well, actually, I, I can't even remember the, the, the last time I've ever <laughs> done a gentleman's because it's so. In, so in theory, you, in theory, I would do gentleman's, but only with people that I know. Yeah. Because you can do gentleman's. You you could in th you could technically do a gentleman's agreement based on board stat. Yeah. And if you know your opponent, you. Could, I, I think I, I if if I if I know my opponent, I think I would do a gentleman's based on board state if if my opponent agrees, because on prizes it's like to, I mean I guess you can take prizes with control, but yeah, slower style deck it, is not going to have the advantage in that kind of game. Yeah, but but I, I guess a, a, a gentleman's based on board state is uh, it's very very much open for interpretation. So the reason I would only do it with people I know it's not not because it's it's mainly because I think you would need very clear communication. Yeah, definitely. So you would you would be you should be able to really understand what you and your opponent are are saying when you're, you know, determining who who has a better uh, who has an advantageous board state, who has more resources left, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's a lot of information you kind of have to like work out like who's actually ahead, and there's not much time you should like be able to handle this pretty quickly. So I think you can in theory do this, but you should probably only do it. When it's kind of clear that you and your opponents, you know, uh, have have a good line of communication, and uh, at large tournaments, you more often than not play against people. Maybe you kind of know them, but you know, it doesn't happen that often that you play against someone someone you're really familiar with. You, you kind of uh, a lot of the times. I don't do gentlemen's. I mean, usually people also don't ask me because they know it's. Uh... But that's that. It it is like it's gonna be a downside. It's definitely less appealing to play control because you kind of can't do gentlemen's, yeah. and other decks can. So I think, I think the tie rate of control decks, uh, actually isn't any higher than other decks. But I, I think the gentlemen's thing is like the the major downside of control in this new, uh, tournament structure because. You kind of want to avoid ties, and gentlemen is one way to avoid ties, and you kind of don't have access to it. I didn't like. I didn't ever really find myself offering them too much last year. I did like one time at like day two of a regional, like when a tie like knocked us both out of cash. Um, but yeah, it's like hard to be like tell your opponent like, yeah, you have two prizes left, but you have no possible way of taking your last two prizes. Yeah. So like, I'm gonna win this <laughs> like, game. Like, oh, you have you have you have no switches left, so I guess you should. Yeah. I mean, like if you're if you if you are gonna win the game and you 
and you and your opponent agreed that you're going to do a jumpman's based on board state, I guess, then it would be fair, but that doesn't really happen. I guess. Yeah, one of my one of my friends, Anna Winnedin, did a gentleman's on prize cards, which did not end very well for him. So yeah, definitely do not um yeah, do not do gentleman's based on prize cards playing control. Yeah. I guess maybe with something more like aggressive like Luxray builds, maybe it's maybe it's better, but yeah, just in general as like a rule. Um it's it's not advisable. Was there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess some some general things looking at the tournament structure. I think it's going to be more difficult in general to make day two. I think with 19 points out of nine rounds, you needed a 70% win rate, and now you need a 75% win rate. So you just need to win slightly more to even make day two. And there's less rounds, so the variance is higher. So you, if you play tournaments, there's just there's going to be bigger swings in your uh, accomplishments so i guess for anyone looking to play tournaments i guess you should maybe shift your expectations slightly but uh, if you if your goal is to make a deep run it doesn't change that much i guess because with a 6 to 1 record in the size the tournaments we're getting you didn't really have a good chance anyway like a six, going 6 to 1 into day 2 wasn't the best starting position to begin with anymore since there are so many players at the time. Yeah, it was terrible. You tied once and you yeah, tied so, over. <laughs> so you, you basically you, you you more or less needed like a 75% win rate on day 1 at least maybe even more to have like a good shot at the tournament. So in the grand scheme of things uh maybe there doesn't change depending on your uh goal doesn't change that much and we, we we shortly talked about this before but maybe if you're kind of on the fence if you want to play control or not maybe you would like some other decks as well but maybe you are open to play control but you're kind of don't look forward to playing nine hours <laughs> and another five hours of this, this super slow deck a lot of also not only is the deck kind of slow and your matches go long but your match, the way your matchups play out are also super different. Like it's, it isn't as streamlined. You might play nine rounds, and every single round you need to apply another uh, strategy, another win condition, and that can be kind of fatiguing. So actually, cutting down on the rounds, if you uh, are not as experienced or who don't like having that kind of tournament, maybe it's actually a good thing that you, that you can actually play control and play. Eight rounds, then another four rounds. It's, it's slightly less. It's not as uh, it's not as devastating of a weekend uh, to play. Maybe for, for me personally, that that's not a factor. I actually love playing the super long, uh, <laughs> the super long tournaments. But I have definitely talked to people who they like control, but they don't uh, want to spend their their uh, their weekend. It's a hobby. It's like kind of like a holiday, something you do for your own uh, your own pleasure. And then having like a super super long day, it's maybe not what they want, and that becomes a little bit little bit less bad, with uh, one less round on each day. So that could be uh, a benefit, I guess. So overall, do you have a positive or like negative um, outlook on these changes? Or um... well, I think so. Okay, so the changes in general, I think they do make sense. I think with the size of, I think nine rounds on day one. Going to eight rounds, that's completely understandable. It's basically there was no way they were gonna, you know, keep this up. Like the the, the mainly for the stuff, it, the days were just so long, and with the player sizes increasing and increasing and increasing, also the, the, with the size of the tournaments increasing, the uh, what what's it called? Like the, the the additional time that each round takes is going to be higher because there's a more a bigger chance that somebody has like a long judge call. So some, I mean, some of the tournaments have uh, this season. You know, day one ends at like <laughs> at like eight or nine. Yeah. <laughs> it's like crazy. Like so, on day one, I completely understand that they shorten it to eight rounds. It, it's it's very reasonable. But I I do I do actually have an issue with the way they do the day two, and especially looking at Europe. I think in America, most of the tournaments are gonna go over 1,024 uh, 1, players. But in Europe, we had a couple tournaments that were like just over like 900 players, right? And with, uh, let's say, a tournament has like 900, 950 players, then that means we are only going to have 11 Swiss rounds and only three rounds day two. 
That's kind of crazy. And that's that sounds really rough, especially since we we would have had, uh, like, I, I think I looked I I looked at like the the like the last season in Europe, and I think if we would would have applied this this structure right now, I think we we would have lost like uh, something like fourteen rounds of Swiss, and that's like a lot. But also a lot of a lot of our tournaments just happened to like kind of. Uh, I think most of our tournaments were sold out, but they, the cap is kind of like around just around like a thousand, just around nine hundred. Maybe the cap is like a thousand players, and the nine hundred something show up, and that means that uh, also also it is it, um, something to to also note that there is going to be a uh, an asymmetrical top cut. So if you are in contention for top eight, you basically gain an ex you you get you basically get your extra Swiss round in day two. So let's say eight rounds day one, and then four rounds, four Swiss, Swiss rounds day two. But there's an asymmetric cut, so there's like an extra an extra top cut round essentially. So that kind of comes down to uh, only like minus one Swiss round if you have four Swiss rounds on day two. But unless you are under a thousand twenty four players, then you you're gonna miss two Swiss rounds on day two. And I, I, in my opinion, that is. Uh, maybe a bit too much. Yeah, it definitely punishes bad matchups, bad draws a lot more. Yeah, the the variance is gonna be yeah, but yeah, the variance is maybe a bit too high. I actually liked the way that this is this is maybe a bit more in line with other TCGs, but I I like the way that Pokemon had so many so many Swiss rounds. It, it's, I mean, all, all card games are games of chance. So there's always going to be some element of uh, you know matchup dependency, luck dependency, and just having like the reason why we play space instead of elimination brackets is to just play so many enough rounds to kind of smooth out the variance. And now we're kind of scaling that back a bit. But uh, yeah, for day one, for day one, it's definitely understandable. I kind of don't like the changes for day two. Yeah, I I think I'm in the in the same boat as that. Um, definitely makes going deeper into tournaments harder. I, well, I guess one thing, well, maybe I already kind of noted this, but I think I'm not sure, but maybe this kind of tournament structure makes it more likely that I'm like interesting interested in playing like some some. I mean, I usually play like pretty rogue anti-meta decks, yeah. but like uh, playing some deck that has like just targets the meta really, like tries to like target the top five decks really hard and just have a very positive win rate against like only like the top decks in combination with being like an unknown quantity, because it that makes it kind of hard to play for people to play against. That usually results in like a, a pretty high, you know, win rate even in your good matchups, which me which means you don't really tie much. Like with the Mewtwo V Union deck at NEIC or the Quad Evil Top deck at LEIC. Like the good matchups were so good in combination with the deck being unknown. And the deck and those decks were like really anti meta. Like they targeted just so a couple of very, very specific decks in the meta. Like having a deck like that is maybe even more appealing because the, the matchups are gonna like your good matchups are gonna be so so favored that you end up dwelling almost all of them so you're not really likely to tie too much and because some control decks are a bit more you know it feels like a bit more controls that kind of get yeah pitch control right is now. pretty like pretty really pitch control is is but... yeah it, it's really wide like it's also like it has like a very the, the so the advantage of pitch controls it has like a very strong base like the the baseline of the deck is pretty high you put a pitch in play you have rotom you draw cards you search cards and you kind of add, add add cards for like a, a whole few of matchups well, like decks like like the the, the quad evil Tool deck was like so specific for just it basically just beat three decks. But if those are the only decks that people play, and was really good at beating them, like like one of the cards, like the last card I added into the evil Tool deck was one lucky egg, which is the the tool that is like the same as gift energy. And it basically, be, so I was testing it against Lugia, and the only way you ever lose is if you <laughs> break at some points. So I was like, well, the, the, the only thing I ever need to do is just not break. So I just added the the tool cards, especially because people played Marnie, right? So it was like the Marnie format. So I was pretty content with just adding just just another card to to not just beat Lugia, but actually always beat them. You break even less. You don't lose to a random Marnie. And 
I think like that those kind of decisions might be, uh, I guess, a bit uh, even a bit more higher higher in the in the in the priority. Not only having good matchups, but really making sure you beat your good matchups even more often. And I guess also maybe a surprise deck is even better because you do gain percentage points by people not knowing the matchup. So if you have a good matchup and your opponent doesn't know the matchup, like it kind of makes your matchup from, let's say you have like a 70-30 matchup against a certain deck, but your deck is completely unknown, your matchup probably becomes like even higher than 70%. And right now, like, why would you, you like, do you really even want a matchup that's that much better? But if you really have to like ne not die and do all your opponents, that is kind of maybe even more uh, more of a consideration playing a deck like that. Yeah, that's definitely a really good point. Something I had not thought of. Um, one kind of counterpoint to that is you feel like the meta is too wide right now, at least yeah, in the current the format, to really make yeah, that yeah, it really depends. Viable. It, I mean, yeah, it, it depends on the format. I think it also obviously de depends heavily on the cards that are available, right? Definitely. Like I feel like the pigeon lends itself really well to having like a, a very toolboxy deck. And Pidgeot is basically the best thing you could do with control. So it feels like, why wouldn't you play the best card in the format for the archetype? You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you aren't. So, uh, and, the, and the meta is quite wide. And I think the meta will stay wide. Like even with like the next set, I think we only gain like the Palkia Area Zero deck and the meta will basically all the deck, all the good decks will remain the same. It's an interesting takes. A lot of people have been saying crazy stuff about the next set. How it's gonna totally, uh... totally change. <laughs> I, I've been. I mean, I so uh, since I I'm not playing the current format. I'm looking at uh, the Japanese results. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, looking at their results, it's it's still like Reggie Drago, Gardevoir, Charizard, Bolt, and Palkia. I mean, it's just the same decks as now, but we also gain. Bulk, yeah. I, I think I do think Palkia is kind of scary for pitch shots, though. Yeah. Because they can they play the Noctowl and they can prime catch your canceling cologne, getting the like the Shuriken yeah, kind of cool. easily. Yeah, yeah, it is true. The meta is why it's like playing a deck that only counters a couple decks feels pretty bad right now. I guess it's like it's kind of funny in a way. It's like Pokemon actually managed to make a couple different decks that are all viable, whereas for a while, it was just like Lost and Box and Lugia. And if you didn't play Lost and Box and Lugia, your deck probably was kind of kind of medium. Yeah. But right now, yeah, right now there's actually like Gardevoir, Zard, uh, the, all the uh, the decks that abuse Ogrebon, all these decks, and I guess Lugia, Lugia itself, you could maybe add in that conversation. All these decks are like compare compare the, the, their their power levels are, you know, in the same ballpark. So it is a good thing for the game that Pokemon actually managed to not have one deck completely dominate. But for control, it does mean that you can't really, you know, play a pure counter box that only targets, that only manages to beat like the three relevant decks because there are just more than three relevant decks. So yeah, that, it is true. If you, you it's, it's also true, like you, even if it's good to maybe in this tournament, uh, this new tournament structure to play a deck that has like very, good matchups and only to arcs a couple decks like if, if it isn't possible you can't like force something that isn't isn't uh isn't there right yeah i really appreciate your time is there any shout outs you need to make any um socials you want to plug uh yeah uh shout outs to my, i guess my team ccg and uh, uh i guess i sometimes use twitter you want to follow me there although i don't actually use it that much you can, I guess, you, you can contact me there if you want to. Well, I appreciate having you. I appreciate the viewers taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate it, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.